This is Alex Bainbridge here with Greenleft, and we're here at number two, the second episode of our new Greenleft show. Thanks everyone for joining us. Today we're going to discuss the topic of freedom for refugees, and this is particularly in the wake of the recent developments of dozens of refugees have been uh, released from detention in Victoria, and we want to uh, celebrate that victory and also look at the next steps for this campaign. Before we get started, I want to acknowledge that we are meeting, we're, fil we're filming this, uh, this new show on stolen Aboriginal land. This always was, always will be Aboriginal land, and we pledge our ongoing solidarity with the struggles for justice for Aboriginal people. At the beginning, I'd like to also mention that we, uh, if you want to support, if you like the work that we do, you want to support our campaigns, uh, you can become a supporter. The link is in the video description below. And we're also approaching our 30th anniversary of Green Left. So we're actually calling for people to send in messages of support or videos, use the hashtag uh, Green Left 30, and uh, yeah, please show your appreciation. Uh, we're here today with uh, a number of guests. I've got Amin Afravi, who is a refugee in uh, Baita, uh, up in Brisbane, and also Sue Bolton, who is a Socialist Alliance member and local councillor on the Moreland City Council, involved in the refugee campaign uh, in Victoria. Also, I've had the chance to speak to Chris Breen from the Refugee Action uh, Collective, and uh, we'll be putting in some of his comments through the show. So thanks everyone for joining us. I'd like to start, Amin, with you. Can you please explain to us why do you think the government has made this move right now? Uh, Peter Dutton has uh, claimed that uh, you know, it's just too expensive to look after refugees, but really um, that has been the case for, for quite some time. And uh, yeah, do you want to explain what you think is the real reason? Well, first, let me uh, say hi to everybody and thank you for setting up this Zoom meeting. So uh, whatever he mentioned in the media, actually, it's not a reason. As everyone knows, uh, since 2013 until now, uh, that was that was the same work that he has been given by advocate, activist, and uh, supporters until now. So, and I believe was changed now, and I know about it because I actually have that contact with lawyers as well, and we know how the process is going on. So, I'm not saying that the protesters they haven't helped the organizations they haven't helped no they help a lot they are the pressure and they had a, they ha they have a huge pre pressure to the uh, government to change their policy but the reality of the release of the guys in here and in uh, melbourne it's because of two lawyers and uh, these two lawyers actually uh, one of them is Nolan, and the another one is Daniel. They are the reason because they raised uh, a complaint or legal action against the government, and we are following up with them. And we know that uh, they are the one done the massive work as well. But as I said, uh, it's not just them. The pressure of the people and the, the work that they have done, like I, let me take this opportunity and thank uh, each one of the people who are working hard for us and they know who, the, who they are because there is some people that they are in that situation, they are not working to help us, they are working actually to gain uh, power, to gain positions. But as everyone knows, and if anyone doesn't know about it, page and see what I shared about some other organizations. The reality of like, there is a lot of supporters, self-organizing supporters, there is some organizations, there is some groups that they done massive work for us. And uh, I believe as, as much as I can say, thank you by word, that is not enough. And I would love to 
see one day very soon I can actually appreciate what they have done in action, not just word. By being a person who can actually make change for my community and whoever needs help. Thanks for that, Amin. Uh, perhaps Sue Bolton, can you please explain to us, like, what was the what was the situation in Melbourne? What was the feeling as the refugees were being released, and what is the sentiment among refugees and supporters in Melbourne at the moment? Well, it was a fantastic feeling um, to see the refugees being released from Park Hotel. Um, I think we've had so few victories in the refugee campaign that it's um, because both major parties are so uh, committed this absolutely cruel, um, pro inhumane policy that um, that's why we've had so few victories. Um, you know, we've had little victories here and there, but, like, this was quite amazing um, to have so many people released, like almost unbelievable um, but unbelievably good. And then also there are a lot of people who've been visiting um, refugees in detention and so they've become really good friends or close friends with people who've been visiting. So there's a real um, really strong personal element with of you know, um, of seeing their friends who they've been visiting um, so they know some people really intimately. And so it was a very personal feeling for a lot of people. And then immediately people's thoughts started to turn to how can, how can we find housing and income support and, and support for the refugees who've been released. So people really quickly turned their minds to that. But also amongst those people um, was a real feeling, especially for people who've been visiting people in detention who weren't released. Um, so the people who weren't released um, were feeling absolutely distraught, not knowing why they'd been left behind. And some of the refugee supporters were in close contact with some of those refugees who are still in detention and were getting messages from them as other refugees were being released. So it was sort of like a feeling of um, jubilation about people being released, but also a feeling of pain for the people who've been left behind. And we know that one man attempted to commit suicide the day after a, bang, a refugee from Bangladesh who was transported to Mitre after the suicide attempt. So people are feeling really anxious and and um, especially, uh, yeah, people who've been in close contact with the refugees and there's a commitment that we need to keep protesting until every single one is freed. And it was also really fantastic that um, not just one refugee who was released, but a number of refugees who were released, especially Moz, who a lot of people have become uh, got to know um, because he's, you know, has been so outspoken. But immediately he and others immediately turned their attention to saying, we've been freed, but we have to camp out, keep going until everyone's been freed. So a lot of the freed refugees have also been coming down and joining the protests, um, possibly not everyone because, you know, people are in difficult circumstances still but um you know Fahad and Moz and others have been coming down um to join the protest calling for their friends to be released from Park Adel. And do you have any comments too about why the government has made this move at this point in time? I think it is a combination of things and probably the fact that the government was about to lose a court case um so I mean, is correct about the legal action. Um, I think it was really a combination of the legal action as well as the pressure outside. Um, but And then we've also seen the UN Human Rights Committee grill Australia over its um, refugee policies, but also other terribly inhumane policies towards Aboriginal people and others as well. Um, but I think it is that combination strategy um, it has been hard for lawyers over the years because the government keeps changing the um, changing the laws to, like every time there's a legal victory, they change the laws to prevent a similar legal victory in the future. 
And it is um, really awful, the fact that some refugees felt that they were forced to say they wanted to be returned to Manus and Nauru in order to be released, like um, that, you know, and the government couldn't keep them in detention indefinitely, given that they'd signed those um, documents. Um, and it's really mainly because PNG and Nauru are not taking back refugees. That was why the government was forced to release them, given that the legal argument put forward by the lawyers was that you can't uh, keep people imprisoned indefinitely if there's no purpose. So um, the no purpose was uh, a result of the refugees signing that they would go back to Manus and Nauru and those governments not taking refugees anymore. So that removed the purpose of the indefinite detention. So, um, but, you know, we've got a big battle still because the refugees who've been released are on bridge, uh, final departure bridging visas, which, you know, final departure means deportation, really. Um, they only go for six months. Um, they don't have any rights other than Medicare and finding job when there's millions of people who are unemployed. I mean, the unemployment figures lie. Um, there's a lot more unemployed than the unemployment figures show. And, you know, it, the fact that they only go for six months um, creates uncertainty about future. Um, and so, yeah, I think... Uh, there's still a big issue and the Labor Party's position is still, while they have improved their policy, like it's not as bad as it was, it's still all premised on the fact that other countries take the ref refugees other than Australia um, and it's premised on the fact that refugees from Manus and Nauru, they don't specifically name Manus and Nauru, but it's all premised on the fact that refugees in offshore detention will go to US, Canada or New Zealand, not Australia. So that's still a massive problem that we have to overturn this idea that refugees not be allowed to come to Australia if they've arrived by boat. Like it's that's the heart of why, um, you know, why, why um, ref, refugees in Manus and Nauru are being treated like this. Thanks for that, Sue. Now, I actually want to play some comments by Chris Breen, who is uh, from the Melbourne, the, the Victorian Refugee Action Collective. He wasn't able to be part of this, uh, this show today because of a, another commitment he's got this weekend. But I want to play those comments now. And the interesting thing is not everybody who's been released now has a case before the federal uh, circuit court. Uh, I do think that's been the trigger, but it's got to the stage where I think it, it becomes untenable to leave handfuls. Not that they haven't, that there are still handfuls. There's still 12 in the Park Hotel who are still there. And there's still maybe 150 around Australia, 100 in Kangaroo Point and more in Villawood and Sydney and um, Darwin. But we are expecting that there will be more releases. So I think the legal things are the trigger. I think the, the protest movement, uh, both the huge protests outside Kangaroo Point in Melbourne at the Park Hotel, which you know was started with the, the refugees themselves inside detention, having daily protests, were also important. It meant that um, the lawyers paid attention to what was going on in the first place. There was an army of people to do the pro bono work and that it was all in public view. So when the coalition government had legal difficulties, they couldn't hide that away. So I think it's a combination of the, the protests and the, the legal action, which has led to the situation that we are now in. And after eight years, um, almost eight years and fighting this battle for so long, it is, it is a substantial win. You know, however it's happened, it is a substantial win and it is, it is, it is quite a thing. Um, you know, the, <laughs> there's a long way to go. The guys have been released uh, only on departure pending visas. So they're six month visas. That makes it really hard to get a job. They can't get education. They're not entitled to the doll, to job seeker, job keeper. Uh, they've only got uh, two weeks housing. We're hoping that'll be extended. So they're entirely reliant on charity. Uh, so the fight for permanent visas, the fight to get everybody, the you know, 267 remaining on Manus and Nauru, 
um, is, you know, is, is part of the, what's, what's happening now. So there's a couple of big rallies still coming up in Melbourne for, to let them stay permanently to free the rest of the Medivac refugees. I mean, I'm, I'm wondering if we can turn to you now. What, what do you, what's your response to the fact that the government has released these refugees in the, in the lead up to an imminent defeat in a, in a legal, in a, in a legal court case. I mean, basically that's still a recognition the government has not actually uh, recognized the humanity and the human rights of, of the refugees that are in detention. What's your comment in response to that? Well, this government actually doesn't care about humanity, doesn't care about climate change, doesn't care about the future of this country, doesn't care about the future of the kids, kids or children of this country, how they're going to grow up, in which way. The, the reality is, uh, how can I say it? I think I, I need to say it in my way, like this government is completely selfish. And they don't really care about anything except themselves. It's going down in in a couple of ways, like treating people, police are hurting people, and look at the at the Aboriginals. They're they're getting more in the problems. They are getting killed, or they they die in a custody, or something like that. So it's it's not just about refugees. It's it's much bigger than refugees and. Uh, we are human beings, we are normal human beings, and we just seek a, a peaceful life. And uh, I believe that uh, uh, they have to listen to their own people, whoever elected them. And people pay tax to see, out to see outcome. So as I can see, and uh, everyone else can see actually, uh, there is no outcome except for their own pocket, for the government pocket, because I believe that people, they pay tax to see new schools, new hospitals, new employment, new companies that people, they can work new, you know, that the government could provide job and lots of things that will make people to have a more peaceful life. But what we can see in this seven plus years is just focusing on a couple of issues to hide some other in more important issues from their own people. Like even if you go back to the situation of Manus Island, why they take us to Manus Island, it's not about boat, it's not about people that are dying in the ocean. The reality was because of actually, China was trying to take over Manus Island and Manus is super strategic in the uh, uh, in past. Actually, it's a It's a missile in the uh, Pacific. And that's why they, they had to use some people as a innocent people to keep them in there so they can build a Navy base for America to protect them from China. So that was our job to torture, staying there being tortured and traumatized all this time and to build that Navy base. And if you look at the last part of Manus Island, police, they went, they, they cut the power, they cut the water, supply, food, food supply, everything. They just trying to move the people from Lombrum, which is the Navy base because it's already uh, finished. And uh, it was US military in Port Mosby and they were waiting for the guys to move from there to Port Mosby or some others areas so they can actually uh the u.s military will go in there i mean the u.s naval so it's a political game and they used us for but i will be more than happy to do whatever i could for my own country or my new country like australia or anywhere but if if the, the if from the first day they came to me and they told me, oh, we need you to do that for your own country. This is Australia and it's gonna be your country. And I will be more than happy to do that, not to be tortured for seven plus years. So about this defeat, it's, it's actually, it has been existing for a long time. 
this law, it has been existing for a long time. And I believe, and I apologize, and I don't want to be disrespectful to the people, organizations that actually, they done massive work for us, but uh, there is a specific organizations that they haven't done anything for us except uh, let's say it in a way that they was using us and still they are using us. And now at the moment, if you look at my Facebook page, you can see that they are trying to claim this victory as well. But this victory goes back firstly to that two lawyers that they take. We have lost you again, I mean, Maybe I know, perhaps I might the turn to The internet is terrible in here. Yeah, sorry. It's that's okay. No, it's not your fault. It's not your fault. We fully understand. Sorry. Perhaps so. Can we turn to you? Uh, what, do you have any comments you'd like to make about like what next? Uh, what next for the demands for the refugee movement? Well, um, clearly we have to call for everyone out. We um, can't stop until we get everyone released. But then. Um, we're also calling for um, permanent visas, not these crap temporary visas, uh, not final, deport, uh, final um, departure visas. We want full permanent protection visas um, so that people can access Centrelink as well as um, other services and so forth. Um, there's also a feeling that state governments should also step up and make some commitments as well. Now, obviously, the worst of the, um, you know, the refugee policy is run by the federal government. Um, federal government is denying access to um, access to job seeker and uh, a whole lot of services. Like they're basically um, trying to starve the refugees. Um, but state governments can provide some support, such as free access to TAFE, um, guaranteed public housing, um, and, you know, access to some services. Some councils can also, um, there are certain services that councils can also offer free to refugees and asylum seekers, and we believe the state government can do that as well. Um, and that would, you know, it doesn't solve things for refugees, but it can assist refugees. So our focus in the refugee movement is that we need to start taking up the issues um, of the refugees who've been released and the call for permanent visas and citizenship rights for people who want to take citizenship out. Um, but, and that is really in common with the around 30,000 refugees and asylum seekers who are waiting for claims to be assessed, um, who are also denied access to job seeker um, and have had the, um, the small payment that people used to get from the Red Cross stripped away from them by the federal government several years ago. Um, and being on the uh, these um, Bridging visas is so discriminatory because they say you've got work rights, but to have access to lots and lots of jobs, both white collar, blue collar, you need particular certificates. Um, you need, you know, recognised qualifications. It's not as straightforward as just stepping straight into a job. Um, and so um, there's that's why there is a need for state governments to step up as well given that the federal government isn't providing any assistance. And that also is a pressure on the federal government as well. Um, but obviously the key thing is permanent protection visas with all of the rights that go with that. Uh, thanks for that. I just wanted to show a few more comments from Chris Breen now. I think that public visible protest has been incredibly important in this year. It's always important and people should never underestimate protests changing things uh, in the year of the pandemic. So uh, RAC in Melbourne has done what it, it can to keep up protest um, all this year in a year that, uh, you know, the protest has largely fallen away because of COVID laws. You know, we haven't seen the climate strikes in the streets. We haven't seen the unions in the streets. 
Um, and I do think that protest kept the focus on the Mantra Hotel and then the Park Hotel all throughout the, the year. One of the protests that we held back in April was a car convoy. Uh, so it was driving around the Mantra Hotel and we put signs on our cars with spray chalk uh, as a way to fit within the, you know, the COVID uh, guidelines uh, creatively. Uh, out of that protest, there were 30 uh, refugee, actually 36, the police now tell us, refugee supporters making over $50,000 in fines, uh, $1,652 each. And I was charged with incitement for being one of the organisers, uh, essentially because I had my phone number on the Facebook post as a contact point. Uh, my, 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 my trial, the first day of it, we've got more to go, um, happened uh, Wednesday uh, this week. And it is, I think, a very uh, concerning uh, development for me personally, uh, but much more, I think, for you know the the white for the refugee movement, for the wider social movements and the the union movements. Um, if I was to be found guilty, um, if I was to be found guilty, I think you could expect that COVID laws would be used to try and shut down protests again in the the, the coming period where the opportunity arises. Um, the, uh, so, and that has implications. I think, you know, we can't go another year without refugee protests, without a climate movement, without unions in the streets over inequality, job keeper, um, job seeker. Uh, so the, the right to protest is essential. Um, you know, I mean, there's all sorts of hypocrisy involved at the same time as our car convoy, there was a country fire authority uh, convoy for a hundredth birthday with 15 cars that took place a few days after the police themselves had a car convoy for a kid's birthday with flashing lights playing happy birthday you know Bunnings was doing a roaring trade um, and I think the right to protest is um, you know and our protest was involved as much care and compassion as they did the right to protest is essential as going shopping I think it has been protest which has led to freedom for the medivac refugees I mean, if you look all along in the refugee campaign over the last eight years, it's been protest and uh, sometimes union action that has been at the heart of some of the big wins we've had. So um, with Baby Asher uh, and the Let Them Stay cohorts, there was a, that came shortly after the Palm Sunday protest at 20,000 and then doctors and health workers refused to release her back to Nauru. There was a union blockade. Um, I think it was behind the uh, the kids off all off campaign. I think the achievement of the uh, the US deal and the Medivac legislation, even though they were things that the movement didn't directly argue for, you know, we were arguing to bring the refugees here and we weren't perhaps strong enough to win that, but we did win sort of halfway houses. And so I think the fact that you refugees went to the US, they came here under Medivac legislation, none of that would have happened without protest. So uh, defending the right to protest is incredibly important. Uh, I was quite heartened the day of my trial. There you know, would have been uh, 60 or 70 people at 8.30 in the morning, you know, <laughs> you know slow holiday period, uh, including four unions. My own union, the Australian Education Union, bought some flags. Uh, we had refugee speakers getting solidarity from refugees. You know, it's quite a thing. Uh, the... <laughs> the uh, the other way around, um, there's probably more to say, but that'll, yeah, that'll do for now. Police were very intimidatory with all of these forms of protest. So people really tried to make sure that the refugees in the Mantra Hotel, as it was then, later they were moved to the Park Hotel, um, that refugees in detention, could, hotel detention, could see that we, were, we hadn't forgotten them, that we were still protesting. And so um, as COVID restrictions were lifted more and more, we um, you know, did more protests, but also some of the people who were involved in the visits who weren't necessarily involved in the refugee organisations necessarily um, really started, you know, they were doing exercising outside the hotel, uh, holding up signs, and also they were standing along Bell Street, which is a massive, um, busy arterial road, holding up signs, getting lots of honks of support. So that also built up 
a wider level of support in the community amongst people who might have never been to a refugee protest, but they could see the regular um, regular number of people with signs outside the hotel, not necessarily a big group, and, and they started doing daily protests, which is a really hard thing to do because not everyone can go to daily protests with work and, you know, everyone's obligations, the kids and all the rest of it. Um, but um, it was great that they did that uh, and that has kept going, big and small protests, and that also helped ramp things up, especially once the COVID restrictions uh, increased and then it meant that when the refugees were released from the uh, Mantra Hotel and transported to the Park Hotel, you know, we had refugee activists following the buses and vans to make sure we knew where we where refugees were being taken to. And I guess um, one other thing I'd like to say, which I haven't mentioned so far, and um, really congratulations to Amin and all of the refugees who've protested inside hotel detention with signs and, and so forth. I think the protest by refugees themselves inside detention has also encouraged refugee supporters outside um, to um, protest because I think that inside-outside communication um, between refugees in detention and supporters outside has really um, kept up the spirits of refugee supporters outside that we can make a difference. And it's also um, being able to have that human contact has been really important for refugee supporters outside. And I mean, before we finish up, do you have any final comments you'd like to make? I just want to appreciate all the work you guys are doing. And uh, uh, I just want to mention to the people who can, after maybe can watch this video, I just want to say that we are just a human beings like them and we fled our countries from danger. And we're just seeking a safe life and peaceful. That's all. We are not criminals. We are not rapists. We are not pedophiles. We are just a regular people like you and others people that they are living peaceful outside. As you can, as you can see that what Mr or the minister, Peter Dutton says that we are safe for the community. So that means we, we have been safe since day one, since 2013. But he went and he lied to the Aussies that they are criminals, they are like this, they are like that. Uh, lots of nonsense words that he given to the Australian people. That is not the truth. And he proved that by the last, I think, the last interview with the radio news. And if you look at, uh, if you if you hear that uh, radio news interview with him, the last part, I believe, I believe that he says we have been threatened by several cases in the court. So it's very clear why he's releasing people. He knows that we are innocent, he knows that we are safe, but he doesn't want to give up whatever he mentioned from day one. We are just innocent people and we shouldn't be in detention or jail or anywhere. We should be free. Thank you. Absolutely. I mean, my heart just goes out to you. Like to have so many years of your life stolen in a completely unfair way. It's just a, it is a, it is a travesty that this has happened. And really, as well as releasing all the refugees, as well as, as well as permanent protection, if there's any justice in the world, there should be compensation paid for all of those, you know, those years that were stolen, those human rights abuses that have been perpetrated unnecessarily by the Australian government. And, you know, this is, this is really an attack on, uh, any human rights violation for anybody is a, is a undermining of the rights for everybody. 
So all of us have every, every reason and every obligation to take a stand for justice in this case. So I think, I think we will wind up this, uh, this uh, show here. I'd like to thank everybody for listening. I'd like to thank Sue and Amin and also Chris Breen for, for taking part. Um, I would like to remind everybody that it is the 30th anniversary for Green Left, so please send in your messages of support. Please you know, click on the button to become a, a Green F supporter. And also just one little other little thing, if you're not yet subscribed to this channel, please uh, give, give the thumbs up and, uh, and, and subscribe. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you. And a privilege to be on the panel with Amin. <laughs>